Uh, my name is Dave Diopondo. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be presenting today uh, with my federal counterpart from NIGC, Tom Cunningham, who I've known for several years. I serve as the executive director for the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi uh, in Michigan and Indiana. Uh, we have three properties in the state of Michigan. As you heard earlier, uh, we have a relatively new Class 3 property in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, and, and real briefly, I want to go over my um, history, only because I'm going to try and make some points, some, some compare and contrast. Uh, it, it'll mean something at the end. So my career track was law enforcement, 36 years, uh, 27 of those with the California Attorney General's Office. Uh, the first 20 as a state narcotics officer, and the last seven as a special agent in charge of the Bureau of Gambling Control in Southern California. Uh, at the time, we had 98 card rooms, uh, commercial entities, card rooms, and 66 uh, tribal casinos operated uh, by a portion of the 109 tribes in California. Uh, and in Southern California, we had the largest casinos on the West Coast, uh, Morongo, uh, San Manuel, Pachanga, uh, as well as the largest card rooms, uh, commercial properties on the West Coast, the Bicycle Casino, Hustler Casino, Hollywood Park, and so forth. Um, and then uh, when I retired in 2012, I became a tribal gaming uh, regulator for a couple of tribes in California and then for the last four years uh, for my tribe in, in Michigan, the Pokagon Band. Sir. All right. Well, you can take Dave's uh, career track uh kind of divide it in half and apply it to me. Because he's so much younger. <laughs> well, but we, my, my point is uh, 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 almost a mirror image. Uh, my, my career was in law enforcement first in uh, 13 years there and then uh, been with NIGC for 17 years. And um, started out as a, what they used to call a field, which is now a In the last couple of years, I've been... Uh, in the leadership uh, group uh, and currently the chief compliance officer. So we oversee uh, and help monitor with the tribes, uh, you know, a little over 500 casinos, uh, working with uh, around 240 tribes. That number fluctuates from day to day, whether uh, they're gaming or not gaming or getting into gaming or uh, starting out. So um, under the compliance division, I have about 60 staff members uh, that are either assigned as a region director, compliance officer, or uh, as an auditor, and uh, together we uh, we work together with the tribes on a daily basis to uh, to help regulate Indian gaming. Yes, we do. Uh, now, and you've heard about IGRA. Uh, what we're going to talk about is how tribes develop those gaming regulations and how we go about regulating gaming on tribal lands. Um, and, and as you'll find, from tribe to tribe, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, and one of those that I would attribute that to is because, uh, as you've heard, the state of purpose for tribal gaming is outlined in IGRA. Uh, and, and, and thanks to our federal overseers, we need to make sure that we craft a gaming ordinance and regulations that are consistent with the goals of IGRA. So did you want to talk about IGRA at all? Uh, just to mention a couple of things because they were brought up earlier today. Um, you know, one of the key things that uh, – one, one of the things – good things that come out of IGRA – was uh, that it, it federally codified that the tribes are the primary regulators on Indian of gaming on Indian lands, and that's a real key, impo key and important point uh, when we're talking about i gaming and sports bet, sports book, and that kind of things. Uh, if, if if those kind of games are going on, if it's Class One, which are traditional games, Class Two, which are your bingo base, non bank games, non bank card games, uh, pull tabs if you offer bingo, or Class Three, which is any other kind of gaming. If it's occurring on Indian lands, the tribes are the primary regulators, and it's, it's gaming conducted under IGRA. And one of the other good things they did, obviously, we talked about a little bit earlier today, is that it set the uh, kind of the standards. I always call it the worst deal a tribe can get. Uh, you know, it codified that, that a tribe has to, has to receive at least 60% of the net gaming revenues from their gaming operations. They have to be the primary beneficiary of gaming. And so... Uh, uh, if, you know, when, when vendors come in and they're making a deal, they always want to start at 4060. Well, that, uh, I tell tribes, that's the worst deal you can get under the law. <laughs> you know, you want to, you want to definitely try to start lower. And I realize that's problematic with, uh, sports book, uh, setting because, uh, the profit margins are kind of narrow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of hands in the pot. You've got the, the, 
the sports book provider, you've got the state, you've got the tribe, uh, and other interested parties that have come to the table and, and wanted their piece uh, uh, of the action. So those are, the, those are some of the good things that come out of IGRA. There's a lot of bad things uh, that we've talked about today in the previous panels that, that fell out of it, too. Yes, and one of the things that IGRA did is it created our, our, our federal regulators, the National Indian Gaming Commission, uh, that uh, Tom is a part of. Um, and I'll, I'll let Tom speak for the NIGC, but from a tribal regulator standpoint, we rely on the NIGC for guidance. We rely on the NIGC for, for advice with regard to staying in compliance with IGRA. Um, you know, NIGC, and, and I would uh, close your ears, to give them their compliments, <laughs> uh, with the advent of COVID, uh, NIGC went about initiating a huge initiative around training, around providing training to tribes uh, who regulate gaming on their tribal lands. And a lot of it is virtual. All of it is totally free of charge. Uh, and they've hit all the topics of concern to us as tribal regulators, from AML BSA compliance uh, to the control of criminal uh, record information uh, to conducting our audits to staying out of uh, the property, unapproved property management uh, realm. Uh, just a tremendous repository of knowledge they've shared with us as tribal regulators in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, is it safe to open my ears now? Absolutely. Okay, all right. Now close yours. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, over the 17 years of working at the NIGC and uh, also was a, a very short-term uh, tribal gaming commissioner uh, way back in about 2003. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I've learned is, uh, you know, the NIGC is a small agency. Uh, there are over 5,000, maybe over 8,000 tribal regulators across the country. Uh, and uh, when, when something new comes about, uh, we might not be the expert. And chan chances are uh, we probably are not the expert on that cutting edge te technology and anything that's happened on a day-to-day -day basis at the tribal level. And so uh, it's important for us to pull in those, uh, those uh, colleagues and, and partners in regulating and, and, and learn from them what, what's going on. So you'll see Dave mentioned our training programs that we've worked on. Uh, we try to, to build those panels so that it's, it's tribal representation, NIGC representation, representation, and sometimes the state as well. Good point. And this is where some of that compare and contrast comes into play that I would like to stress. So you have state regulators, state gaming regulators, and I can only speak to California since that's my experience, and tribal gaming regulators. Uh, in California, the number of state regulators is so thin, you're not going to find, at least uh, for my staff in Southern California, and I'll speak for my counterpart in Northern California, we were not in tribal casinos on a consistent day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it was very itinerant. Uh, it was it was very sporadic, nor were we on commercial properties on a 24 seven daily basis. Uh, as with most other state regulatory agencies, we had a law enforcement mandate as well. So investigating illegal gaming operations uh, in the community, uh, Internet gaming, uh, Internet cafes, those types of illegal unapproved gaming was the charge for the state regulator. Uh, so actually being on property at a tribal gaming facility or even a commercial card room, uh, few and far between. Uh, luckily, if we made it on property once a week, whereas tribal gaming regulators are there 24 seven. We are the presence uh, within that tribe. And the other thing to consider is the mission slightly different. So because of our ordinance, because of the way IGRA is, tribal gaming regulators have basically three mandates. So as we go through the regulations, you can get it down to three common denominators ensuring the integrity of gaming, protection of tribal assets, and providing for public health and safety. Just about every regulation that's created can be traced back to one of those, one of those three mandates. Whereas state game, gaming regulators, we work on behalf of the state. We protect the interests of the state. We protect the interests of the gaming public. So integrity of gaming, absolutely. Protection of tribal assets, not so much. Ensuring that the state receives uh, it's fiscal revenues, absolutely. Read any tribal, gate, tribal state gaming compact, and a lot of those sections have to do with ensuring the revenues uh, that are due to the state come to the state. Uh, so where that comes into play is as an independent arm of government for tribal regulation. I, I work, uh, ultimately, my gaming commissioners are appointed by tribal council, independent arm of government. We work to protect the operator. 
because the operator's revenues are what drive programs on tribal lands. When I was a state regulator, I'd get a call from a card room or a casino, a tribal casino, and the complaint was against the vendor, hey, I'm having trouble with this vendor. Well, there were no regulations that gave me authority with regard to that type of conflict. So the response nine times out of 10 was that's a civil issue between you, the casino operator, and your vendor. Not an area where you're going to find state gaming agencies becoming, or state gaming regulators becoming involved. So it's a slightly different list of priorities, uh, tribal regulators versus state gaming regulators. Also, remember, I mentioned I came from narcotics. Well, I went into the Bureau of Gambling Control right about the time that they were pulling people into the Bureau of, Ga- or into the Bureau of Gambling Control. All of us came from narcotics. And still to this day, many state regulators come from law enforcement agencies. Very rarely do you see state regulators coming from the casino industry. Whereas in my tribal gaming commission, we bring people from casino surveillance, from slots, from table games. That expertise is built in when they come into the gaming commission, tribal gaming commission, in terms of skill and expertise almost non-existent for those coming into state regulatory agencies. I think uh, my, my wife and I went to a casino once for the buffet uh, before I actually went into the Bureau of Gambling Control. Uh, so it, it just not something. So my point is I would hold the skill and experience of any tribal gaming regula- uh, regulator against the state gaming regulator any day of the week and twice on Sunday. It's just a fact. Yeah. Um, not to disparage state regulators, they're really nice people, but the expertise frequently isn't there. Uh, we derive, uh, derive our regulations from the tribal ga- gaming ordinance. That's the law. Now, if you read tribal gaming ordinances, you'll find that there are commonalities from one to the other. Why? Because those ordinances have to go to NIGC for approval to make sure they're consistent with the mandate laid out uh, in IGRA and the CFRs. So they're very similar in nature. So I would submit that um, as the oh dude it's not working. You think you think that's all right. That yeah. while he's working on that, I'll I'll add to that. Um, you know, the difference between the state and NIGC uh, regulators is the the NIGC regulators and the agency itself is there uh, on behalf of the tribe in most instances. Well, we also you know protect the interests of the United States government, but the United States government's interest is 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 the success of the tribe in their gaming industry. So uh, we kind of wear a similar hat. Uh, I think early in the history of NIGC, uh, there was conflict uh, a lot of times over, you know, what is class two and what is class three. Those have kind of been resolved over the last couple of decades. Uh, and, you know, there, there are sometimes, uh, from time to time, there's a, there's a disagreement on, on certain terms. But for the most part, uh, the last decade, it's been, a, it's, it's been almost a hand-in-hand partnership uh, between the agency and the and the tribes and their regulators, so it's uh, I think it works out good that way, and uh, we'll probably uh, you know we'll continue along that way. We're we're uh, we hope that that's the case because uh, it's it's so much easier uh, for bo- for both parties uh, when we can find the common answer and and common ground to work from. Absolutely, and and, and I would say that for a tribal gaming regulator. The distinction class two to class three, with a few exceptions, uh, really, when you get back to whether it's protecting the integrity of gaming, uh, pre- preserving tribal assets or public health and safety, it doesn't matter really whether it's class two or class three for the tribal gaming regulator. There again, to contrast that with the state. Uh, so when I was a state regulator, I had no jurisdiction in class two. That means when I arrived at a casino, a tribal casino, the bingo games were off limit to me. The, the bingo themed devices were off limits to me. The poker room was off limits to me. Uh, my jurisdiction was restricted to the class three games and the class three games only. And then the jurisdiction was narrowed depending on the sections of the compact. Um, and I can tell you example after example, as a straight regulator, I would interact with the tribal regulator and say, hey, I noticed you have a, a new machine on the floor. Any chance, and this happened to me at Pachanga years ago, any chance I could get the owner's manual, a copy of the owner's manual for this brand new machine? Uh, the folks up in Sacramento are asking. And the response was, sure, just have your governor send my chairman a letter and we'll make sure to get that for you. <laughs> Nicely done. Just a way to check the state yeah. regulator and put him in his place, right? So it's a very narrow window um, that the state has authority to, mm-hmm. to uh, exercise uh, their, their regulatory powers. Contrast that with the commercial properties. 
uh, where we had absolute regulatory, every dynamic. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, at least in California, because we had a prohibition on games involving dice, no craps games, no roulette games, a wall and a beal, uh, wall, uh, a wheel and a ball off limits, uh, prohibition on Vegas style 21 in the commercial properties. The nature of our investigations were very specific. I give an example. Um, mystery card roulette years ago. Remember mystery card roulette? Yeah. The state's uh, attorney's opinion was that was an illegal game that was being offered on tribal casinos. So our task in the state regulators was to go out and do the investigation to gather, gather the data to send up to the attorney so they could issue a legal opinion. Um, the other thing, remember I mentioned revenues? Um, we had uh, the, uh, back in uh, early 2000s, the introduction of multi-station EGDs electronic gaming devices. You could have eight stations, 10 stations, 12 stations. Uh, well, because the state revenues were dependent on the number of gaming devices, the opinion was each one of those player points constituted a slot machine. Now, the tries position was, no, 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 they all tie back to a common server. The server is one gaming device. Those are the types of investigations we would be involved in. And then on the commercial, uh, commercial card room side, it was, it was frequently the, a casino, someone from the tribal, uh, tribal gaming regulatory agency, and there's different names, gaming commission, gaming authority, different names, but the commission would call my office and say, hey, such and such a card room in Los Angeles is offering straight up 21. So we would have to send undercover agents in there to actually play the games to see whether or not they were playing California's legal version of 21, and if they won't, weren't, then there were fines and penalties and all kinds of bad things would happen. Uh, but that was the dynamic. State regulators get tied up in a whole lot of uh, investigations and inquiries that as tribal gaming regulators, we don't. We just don't. Um, Dave, if I can add to that. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, another advantage of our agency is we are not only funded by the tribes uh, through their gaming operations and, and fees that are paid to the, to the NIGC, um, our focus is purely on tribal gaming. Um, and it's, you know, whether it's class two or three, uh, that's where our focus is. Our role was completely sw switched between the state. Uh, you know, we had shared, uh, regulatory responsibility with tribes for class two gaming. Uh, we play a very minor role in class three. So we kind of run into the same, uh, dynamic just the other way flipped around is we, we could look at everything class two. And class three was, uh, we could look at what the tribe was, was willing to show us, uh, unless their ordinance said otherwise. Uh, there are several tribes in California and some other places across uh, the United States that have specifically given NIGC class three internal control uh, monitoring authority. And uh, obviously with the secretarial procedures that just recently come out uh, for, uh, for the uh, tribes in California that went through that process, uh, instead of the state being the regulator for their class three, they designated NIGC as the regulator for their class three internal. Exactly. So in, in looking at our tribal gaming regulations, and I use ours as an example, but most of them are the same. I will tell you that tribal gaming regulatory industry uh, were very collegial, uh, extremely collegial. Uh, we're sharing information with each other all the time. And that, in fact, the first email I received this morning uh, when I logged in to check my email was some, one of my counterparts in Michigan uh, who had a, li a licensing question. Say, hey, we're looking to change up our licensing regulations. Can, can you and others within Michigan share what you do in this situation? Uh, we're extremely collegial. So you're going to find commonalities when you review the regulations because we share them with each other. Uh, our regulations at Pokagon are available to anyone here on the Gaming Commission's website. You can download all the regulations and there's no, no secrets there. Um, and we also do outreach. So, um, it, uh, it's the end of uh, the end slide, but I'll jump ahead. Four years ago, we entered, when I say we, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, entered into sports wagering and iGaming uh, with the legalization of such in Michigan. Uh, so we have sports wagering in both Indiana and Michigan, and we have iGaming in Michigan. Uh, iGaming is not legal in Indiana yet. Uh, but four years ago, when I joined the commission, the tasking was, we need you to write iGaming and sports ra uh, wagering. Reg they were non-existent. There was one tribe in the United States that had regulations, and I did read all those. But I will tell you, use Nevada, use New Jersey, use Connecticut, uh, and a few, for, a uh, few foreign jurisdictions to pull those regulations together for, for our tribe. 
Um, but the other important dynamic that you'll that you'll find in tribal gaming regulation, and Brandon mentioned it earlier today, we're very dependent on the goals and the concerns of our operator. So we don't create regulations in a vacuum and say, here, casino, live with these, uh, or here, vendor, live with these. We want to have that that conversation of whether or not the regulations we're preparing to present to our commission uh, to approve are workable for the operator, that are workable for the vendor. Now, we didn't have that four years ago because we didn't really know who we were going to partner with or the casino didn't really know who they were going to partner with. So we created the regulations. They were imposed on the platform provider that we negotiated with and uh, the sports wagering company, uh, as well as all the, the contributing content providers. Uh, but we have a revision process. Uh, and every year we revise our, our uh, regulations to make them better. Uh, and a lot of times we'll revise them in response to uh, NIGC's issuance of new guidelines with regard to internal controls. Uh, and usually our independent audit company uh, that audits the casino will come back and say, we recommend the Gaming Commission change the internal controls to meet NIGC's new guidelines. So we do that review every single year. Uh, but the first year was our opportunity to reach out to the vendors and say, what was the grief? What were the challenges in our regulations to you furthering your business goals? Because if we can change those to meet your needs and still maintain our regulatory uh, responsibility, we're good to go with uh, recommended changes. So we have changed those over time. Uh, but licensing is huge. Uh, and licensing, you'll find there are commonalities with regard to uh, licensing uh, parameters or requirements from a regulatory agency to regulatory agency on the tribal side. Uh, we're, considered, we're concerned about key employees and obviously property management officials, those who have an influence over the outcome of the game or the disposition of, of tribal assets. So that's huge for us. But you're going to have casinos that are relatively small in number where the employees are small. We have 2,973 employees as I stand here today at Pokagon. Uh, but you may have a casino that employs two, 300. And what they'll do is designate everyone as a PMO or key and license them as such. Why? Because they may be put in that role in some day, and we don't want to repeat the licensing, uh, the licensing process. So that's usually where the changes come from. Anything on that? Uh, what I just uh, want to comment on is, is uh, you know, hit a little bit on what Dave was talking about. You know, watching uh, from afar sometimes, uh, particularly if it's a class three uh, regulation that the tribe's looking at passing. Uh, one of the things that's great about the networks that uh, the tribal gaming regulators have set up is you see that if there's a new product that rolls out, be it iGaming, be it uh, sports betting, be it uh, cards and dice, uh, if if uh, or ball and dice games in a, in a jurisdiction that hasn't historically offered that, like in Oklahoma, what you saw were the tribal regulators come together and they take uh, take the wheel that's been invented by someone else, you know, uh, and 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 match it to what's going on in their in their jurisdiction, and uh, try to try to have that model regulation uh, ready to go in the event that uh, the tribes and the state can reach agreement on uh, adding something new to the compact. And uh, the advantage of that, obviously, is uh, you don't have to uh, immediately become the expert on that. You, you take the, the expertise from your, your, your other colleagues that are either in commercial gaming or in tribal gaming. Uh, one thing I've learned is just because Nevada does it, just because uh, Atlantic City does it doesn't mean it's going to work in a in a tribal jurisdiction. Sure. You know, there's there's uh, there's certain things that the tribe is going to want to control. They're going to evaluate their risk uh, of what they see as the risk, weigh it, and decide: Do we need that level of control? Uh, do we want that level of control in the tribal regulation, or we're going to leave that to the operator uh, to figure out how they're going to do that through their procedures? Awesome. And as usual, see, we're at zero time because Tom let me monopolize the entire conversation. <laughs> Dang it. I'm sorry about that. You just want to flip through a couple of the slides, and I'll just close it out with, with a couple of points. Um, I encourage you that if you're going to do business with the tribe, uh, not only engage with the operator, which you obviously will for business purposes, but engage with that tribal gaming commission, that regulatory agency as well. If, As Brandon made the point of, if we understand what your goals are, if we understand what the business framework looks like, um, we can better craft regulations to serve your needs as much as they serve our needs. Um, and iGaming and sports wagering, no better example than that. 
uh, we negotiated or uh, the, the casino uh, brought in a sports wagering provider from outside the country. Um, and our first our, our first experience, uh, we, we had to correct them. Uh, so they had we had a change management process and we had regulations for this, but I would submit they probably didn't read them too well. Uh, so they sent us a note saying, hey, we're going to. Uh, we're going to update the software in the kiosks, right? Uh, so they did that remote and then immediately provided uh, those kiosks for, for uh, engagement by the patrons. We had to correct them and say, eh, time out. Uh, we have a standalone game technology unit within our gaming commission, and we're required to verify that software with the independent gaming lab before you can offer it to patrons. So understanding what those regulations are and the dynamics will keep you from stepping into uh, mistakes right at the outset. And we've managed to, to fix that with our providers. And there again, it's an ongoing conversation. Let us know what you need and, and we'll craft regulations on the part of the operator pr to protect them uh, and make sure that the vendors succeed. Sure. Um, Dave, if I'll just make one quick plug. Uh, we talked, heard the other panelists talk about it today, declination letters. Uh, that's something that our agency offers uh, both to tribes and to vendors. Uh, and that's if you're about to reach an agreement or you think you're going to come up with a template agreement that you might want to use with different tribes. Uh, you can send that template letter in unexecuted. In other words, no one signed it yet. Uh, you can send it into our Office of General Counsel. They will go through it and they will look at that document and tell you, is this a management contract? Is this a sole proprietary interest uh, violation? Uh, what they try to do is identify any, any control by the vendor uh, that would lead to management. If it is management, it's not a game stopper. It's just you should go through the management contract approval process. But if you don't want to be a manager, uh, they'll work with you to help take out that language and provide you a little bit of guidance on how to stay out of that camp if you don't want to be a manager. And also, you, as obviously, we take a look at the, the sharing of the revenues uh, for SBI purposes. So it's a, it's a really good tool. It's free uh, or at no cost. Nothing's free. The tribes have already paid a regulatory fee that covers the cost of those products. So uh, take advantage of it when, when time permits, and uh, it can save you a lot of trouble down the road because for vendors it's important to know if you get hit with the managing without an approved contract violation, usually one of the punishments is is that you don't do business in Indian country for a set amount of time. And so you're not just done there at that tribe. You're not just done in that state. You're done across the country, and that's you know that's that's a very heavy impact that you you want to try to mitigate before you ever get to that position. Really good point. Well, thank you everybody for attending, and uh, hopefully you'll have access to the presentation. If not, if you want to give me your business card, I'll make sure you're entered into the MacBook raffle uh, after I return your, <laughs> your info. All right. Thank you everybody. Thanks.